So we're talking about family theorists tonight. But like, go ahead and pick up those. Um, Pam, this is Lasandra. I wanted to share something. Please. Um, I took the practice test today, and I wanted to share a question with you that I got wrong and wanted to have, get get some explanation. Because um, I am the expert, right? <laughs> of course. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the question says, a social worker is asked to, to analyze new social welfare policies that will affect the community. What should the social worker do first? So, a, oh, no, wait, wait. Okay. So, if I ask you, can you, tell, can you analyze what um, COVID is going to look like in January? What would you tell me? I, I don't know. Exactly. So when you're asked to analyze a forward question, you, you can't. I right. can't go forward. All I can do is go back and learn from what's happened already. Oh, that is the answer. Okay. So we, I can, I mean, you know, analyze the future. I mean, I can guess what's going to happen, but I really don't know. Right. Okay. So I can't analyze the future. Does that make sense? Well, was, read the question again. There's something forward going. It says a social worker is asked to analyze new social welfare policies that will affect the community. What should the social worker do first? Okay. The, choice, the choices are A, examine the likely impact of the policies on the community. B, research the historical problems that led to the policies. C, organize a gas roots, I think that's co coalition. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So a, a grass a grassroots coalition is a that's a community term. Like everybody in the community get everybody in the community on the same page. Yeah. Okay. To discuss reaction to the policies and D look into legal precedents that could potentially could potentially nullify the policies. I chose research the historical problems that led to the policies, but that was wrong. And the correct answer is examine the likely impact of the policies on the community. Are you sure about that? Um, that's what it says on here, because I, I chose research the historical problems. That that's, led. that's usually the answer. Well, you can. Oh, wow. And, and the correct answer is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading that backwards. I'm sorry, group. I chose examine the likely impact of policies on the, com on the community, and the and the answer was research the historical problems that led to the policies. Okay. And I I was just a little confused by that. But you are and you and you might see a couple of those types of questions in general um, when it comes to looking at new policy or if you're looking at changing your agency's mission statement. You have mm -hmm. to go back to look at what you've done already to figure out if you want to keep it or not, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm looking at examining the future, I have to usually go back. And I got one more. Mm -hmm. One more I want to share with everyone. It says, what task is the first step in setting up a program evaluation? So the choices are A, selecting the criteria for measuring success, B, determining the goals and objectives, C, assessing the available resources. D, designing the methodology. Now, when I was taking it, I was thinking of assess, assess, assess. So I chose assess the available resources. So but, the question is, I'm setting up, how do I evaluate a program, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then when you're being evaluated at the end of the year or your, your year in review, don't you want to know how you're being evaluated before the end of the year? Yeah. So I need to set some criteria so I know, like, don't just call me in at the end of the, the end of the year and say, oh, by the way, Pam, you did awful. And like, I had no idea what you were even looking at. Right, right, right. So now translate that into the answer. Okay. All right. Thank you. So what's the answer? Oh, the answer was determining the goals and objectives. Okay. So measurable. And whenever you're, whenever you see a question on the test about goals and objectives, that have to be measurable 
and they have to match the question. Okay, because they'll trick you sometimes and it'll be measurable, but it's not really answering what the question is asking me. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Okay, okay. Um, this is the ASWB test. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So no, yeah. So um, in general, those of you who have taken the test before, do you think the ASWB test is an accurate portrayal of the real test? I've heard yes, I've heard no. I'm just curious as to what you think. You're a yes, I hear a no. I've heard both too, like yes and no. <laughs> it's either yes or no. There's not the test. <laughs> I don't I don't know what to believe. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ramanisha, do you mind sharing a little bit? How do you think it was not as um, uh, encompassing? Were the questions easier than the actual test? Hey, yeah, I think that um, the practice test was way like simplified and straight to the point. And on a real exam that I took this past Thursday, it was real wordy. Some of the questions took me in loops. Um, yeah. I can remember some of them, um, like the community question kind of was like the one, um, the lady just talked about the social worker was working with a Mexican, the Mexican population and they were changing legislation, uh, the, the, the uh, like rules and regulations, I guess. And they were like, what should the social worker do first? And some of the uh, answers was like, give them the directions in English and Spanish um go around and like talk to them like on a personal kind of level i guess or get them to um introduce themselves and i was just like i didn't understand so a couple of things come to mind is the steps of community organization so if you are new to the community right you want to follow those four organizational steps um, orientation, right? Orientate myself to the community, let them know who I am, know who they are. Then the second one, I would want to, um, there's going to be some conflict, right? That third stage is the, the group emerges. Okay. And then at the end, they go out and reinforce. So those are the four steps. My first thought was that's like making sure I'm doing one of those first steps. Also, we a cultural question. Um, I know that um, many of my um, Hispanic Latina families, um, need more self-closure, self-disclosure from the therapist before they're willing to share. So all of those clinical things that I know about, I've learned about, you know, the Hispanic population as well as um, what happens in, in the community steps. So some, that's one of my thoughts of what, where they would have gone. And now the practice test does not change. It is the same practice test. And one that took me in a loop was um, the social worker and her colleague was in a meeting and the colleague wanted the, social worker, the other social worker to tell the client not to be in a certain relationship. And I think the answer I chose was that the social worker um, recognized self-determination or something like that. Um, like you can't tell me to tell this person that they can't be in this relationship. But it was like, it went into a circle because it was like the colleague was telling the social worker to do something with the client with her own client yeah it was tricky it was wordy and just tricky i i, I forgot what i picked i think i picked the one where the social worker recognizes that um you know the client has self-determination that you can't tell them that you can't be in this relationship but instead of them just saying, the, you know, a client and a social worker, they threw up the colleague in it. So it was like a triangulation thing. Mm -hmm. So I so I'm thinking code of ethics, right? So first of all, if it's not, if it's my client, then why is she telling me anything to do with my client, right? She shouldn't even know anything about my client. And then I'm thinking if it's her client, then she shouldn't be talking to me about her client. And I can't have a relationship with either one of them because then it's a dual relationship. Yeah. So I don't know. But when I when I see the questions, that's I mean, I'm pulling in all of those things to try to figure out what they want from me. What are they trying to prove that I know? 
that makes sense yeah yeah I, easier easier on my side right um when there's a question regarding ethnicity um you always want to kind of make sure that that if they mention their client is Hispanic, if they mention the client is Asian, there's a reason for that. So I, if you, I'm sure you've all are biblical scholars, but when the Bible mentions like the woman at the well or somebody's name in particular, it means something. So when the, when the question says, you know, it's a single woman, it's a married man, it's a, it's a this, it's a that, it means something. So don't, don't ignore that. OK, don't always assume that's the right answer because they had it said Hispanic, but definitely don't ignore that. OK, Rosa. I was wondering which code of ethics version we should study because there are there are differences. I have. Um, the what are the differences? 17 and it talks about not. Not the older one talks about not having a relationship. And the new one says that it's the responsibility of the social worker whether you have a relationship with a former client or not. They both say the same thing. Um, there weren't changes between the 2014 and the addendum 2018. So the question is, um, can you have sex with a former client? It does not say you cannot. It doesn't say that. The code of ethics says you should not. It says you can never, never, never have sex with a current client, right? No, 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 no. But with a former client, then um, you have to, um, if you choose to, and I don't know why you would choose to, there's all the other people out there. I agree. If you, ch and it's, that hasn't changed. OK, so what we teach and what and especially my young social workers, what I teach is just no. Right. But that is truly not what the code of ethics says. So if you get a question that says, um, you know, can you have the code? Of, the code of ethics um, prohibits all relationships with former clients. It doesn't. It, it does not. It says you shouldn't. But it doesn't say that you you can't. So if you look at am I sharing my screen? Yes. OK, so. Yes. A social worker under no circumstance, no circumstance should engage in sexual activity, inappropriate sexual con um, communications or anything with a current client. No, 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 never, 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 no. Clear, right? If he's your current client. However. Can you make that larger, please? You know, I lost it, right? I've been using the APGAR book, and the APGAR book makes reference to the 2008 Code of Ethics. Um, so I always say read the Code of Ethics from the Code of Ethics. Um, and and I, do, I do agree there are some really good explanations in there, but always read them from the Code of Ethics. Yes, it's, re it's a really good book. And, and um, there's some really good things in there, especially it talks about what exactly to do if you get a client um, who's court ordered. So those exact steps of what to do. However, okay, so back with my, my sexual relationships. Okay, so under no circumstances, never, 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 never with the current client. So social workers should not engage in sexual activity or sexual contact with clients, relatives, or individuals who are um, with whom the client maintains a personal relationship. However, if I do, then social workers, not the clients or the client's relatives, um, maintain, I carry the full burden. So if I do, then I assume full responsibility. Okay, so with my, my um, client's relatives or a former client, I should not. But if I do, so the only one it truly says you can't is a current client. Okay, so I, if I haven't made that clear, so that's that it doesn't say you cannot. It says you shouldn't. Then there's section six, social workers, ethical responsibility to the broader society. That's in the 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so say again, my, my group, my goal to the greater society. 
There is a section mm -hmm. six. Yeah. So that, but that hasn't, that's okay. Maybe you're reading like really old, but the 2014 was no, the, the last change. Uh, yeah. But so, but 2014 is the last change, the last change. So 2014, I mean, 18, that hasn't changed. So we're supposed to um, give back. We're supposed to, um, it, it's okay for us to pick it. Right. So if there's something going on and we're supposed to support society. So if there's something that, that's really unethical going on, as long as it doesn't harm my client, I'm supposed to, to do that public participation, social and political action. I'm supposed to. And it, it's about making sure that's fair for my client, not about my own prefer, for my own personal needs, but for my client. So, for example, if you work in a hospital and uh, everybody in the hospital goes on strike. You have the right to do that as long as it doesn't harm your client. Okay. We should act to expand choice and opportunities for all people with special regards to vulnerable, disadvantaged, oppressed, and exploited people. Do you guys know that like half the people like in Congress um, have an MSW? So part of that community involvement is making those macro changes. That's what we're supposed to do. The public emergencies, if there is a, um, uh, a, a tornado, a fire, something in your area, you're supposed to give back. You're supposed to volunteer your time and go and, and, and help. Okay. And that's what that is. This is um, from, it's not new from 14. Bless you. Bless you. Okay. Social workers should educate themselves, their students, and their colleagues about responsible research practices. You're supposed to research. Do you know that? Everybody's like, what? No, that's part of our code. If we don't do the research, then we, we learn off research from other professionals, and, and that's not what we should do. Uh, Stephanie, what's your question? Okay. So my question is, and it's coming from Atgard, in the pre-contemplation stage of change, resistance is best addressed by a social worker, A, looking at the pros and cons of behavior change, B, acknowledging a client's fears and concerns, C, assessing whether new developments in a client's life are causing barriers to the plan, or D, reviewing the appropriateness of the intervention. So in, I mean, the, the client is in the pre-contemplation stage? Yes. Okay. So pre-contemplation means that they, that person is standing in front of you saying, I don't have a problem. I just got out of jail yesterday for drunk driving, but I can stop drinking anytime I want. So that's what's happening in that stage. So what are your four choices? And everyone, listen, and everyone make a decision here. Go ahead. Looking, A, looking at the pros and cons of behavior change. Okay. B, acknowledging a client's fears and concerns. C, assessing whether new developments in a client's life are causing barriers to the plan. Or D, reviewing the appropriateness of the intervention. Anybody? So the pros and cons, looking at the, the second one had to do with feelings, right? Yes. Client's fears and concerns. Okay. In pre-contemplation stage, um, that is truly they're in denial. Exactly, exactly. They are in denial. They like, what do you mean? No, I can stop drinking anytime I want, right? Um, 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 so um, I know none of you guys have ever had that issue. But, you know, have you ever had a girlfriend or a guy friend and you knew their, their spouse was cheating and you told them and they like, uh-uh, and you've got like pictures on your phone of their, their partner with somebody else. And they're like, no, that can't, that was wrong. That was, that was like, no, that's, that's free contemplation. I want to make a comment about your president. <laughs> so... What's the answer? <laughs> I have no idea what the answer is. That's what I would guess A, the pros and cons. Yeah. We're not at the feelings level. 
Okay. Yeah, well, he's not at the feelings level. Um, because in pre contemplation, I'm trying to look at your behavior. So that's the trans trans theoretical um, model of change. So I if I um, it's not about my feelings, it's my behavior is getting me in trouble. So the pros and cons. So if you if you keep continuing to use drugs, what's gonna happen? If you don't use drugs, what's gonna happen? So that's that would be my my best guesstimate. Yes. Um, in terms of the explanation, they said that um, pre contemplation is the first step in the process in the change process. Mm -hmm. In pre contemplation, a client is unaware, unable, mm -hmm. and or unwilling to change. This stage is characterized by a client arguing, interrupting, ignoring the problem, and avoid talking or thinking about it this so, so that last worker, one was about resistance wasn't it yeah sorry um a social worker should establish a rapport acknowledge resistance or ambivalence try to engage a client and recognize his or her thoughts feelings fears and concerns i think i like that one better so it would be b that was d the last one wasn't it reviving Sorry, reviewing the appropriateness of intervention, that's D. No, um, so the one that talked about resistance, because that's where he's at. Yes. Um, acknowledging the client's fears and concerns, assessing whether new development in a client's life are causing barriers to the plan, or looking at the pros and cons of behavior change. The choice that they gave was acknowledging a client's fears and concerns. But I was struggling because I wasn't sure how it would connect based on the fact that the client would have been resistant. Um, I don't, I don't know that I would agree with that. It's question 169 in APGAR. In APGAR. Um, yeah. I don't know. And But she tells you like what page it's on. That's one thing I like about that. So go back and, and get, read her explanation about that. Yes, that's the, the uh, what I was reading before was the explanation. Um, um, but in, in like in the in the book, it talks about like what chapter that's in. Oh, does that make sense? Because I I don't know that I would agree with that, but I'm not definitely not gonna. I think she's she knows she's amazing. Oh, it's in unit one, and mm -hmm. it's under human development and the diversity and behavior in the environment. Okay. So those are stages of change, and then knowing that. Um, pre-contemplation then and someone said contemplation is pros and cons um, so it can be depending on where the, the client is right mm -hmm. let me just kind of pull up a it's called the trans theoretical model of change if you ever see that it is by like a uh, Prochaski and De, De Clemente It was it was mainly started out to be used with alcohol and drug users, um, but now we actually use it in in all. And um, I usually kind of talk about it in even you know with them um, as we decide to lose weight. That when they're in that first stage, that's like we have no idea, right? No idea. Someone tells us, "Oh my gosh, Pam, you're getting kind of heavy." I'm like, ah, I am not. I don't know what you're talking about, right? And then contemplation is you're aware of the need for change, um, but you haven't begun making any commitment. So pros and cons, contemplation is usually past that one, is it not? Because that should be in, in pre-contemplation. And then preparation, you're making the decision, right? You're preparing. Okay. And then your action is what you're going to do, maintenance and termination. So the way I usually describe it is, so I, again, all of us, almost the women I know, we like to, we're on a diet all the time, right? So free contemplation is... Um, you know what? My girlfriend says, wow, Pam, you know, those jeans are too tight. I'm like, what? I have not gained any weight. I am still the same size that I got when I was married. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Really, really, really. And truly in denial. Just not even aware that that things have changed. Contemplation is then, you know, I go in and put on my favorite jeans and I'm like laying on the bed, sucking up my gut, trying to zip them up. <laughs> right. So I'm sure that's only me. But so that's that's contemplation. Like, oh, gosh, my friend is right. You know what? Mm, I need to do something. 
Okay. So then preparation, then I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I, I need to make a change. This isn't working here. I, I don't have any clothes to wear. Oh my gosh. So preparation is I'm calling Weight Watchers. I'm calling the gym. I'm trying to find a, a plan. I'm reading up on keto, blah, blah, blah. I'm getting, oh, let's try this one. I'm getting the information. Then the action is what I'm going to do based on my plan. And then I'm going to start when I'm starting my action, right? And then either I maintain or I stop. So maintenance usually for me is like, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm great. I'm going to have my salad and count my calories and 1,200 calories and like, I got this, right? But by Friday, somebody's brought in a pizza to the office and I'm like, forget this. <laughs> my id wins pizza, right? <laughs> then I have the need to terminate because it didn't work out well for me. So it's relapse. So I've relapsed. But when you relapse, you don't go back into um, pre-contemplation or, con or contemplation because you know there's a problem, right? So when you relapse, you go back to preparation or action. Now to kind of put that in the question of what she of what she asked, um, I I hear what the, I hear what the answer was, but I would think in pre-contemplation and clients are resistant. They're very resistant. It's like they don't think there's a problem. But I don't know the feelings are there. Because when I'm in denial, there are no feelings. She said the answer. What was the answer, um, Stephanie? The answer was B. Which was? Uh, acknowledging a client's fears and concerns. Okay. Okay, dokie. Other questions? <laughs> Let's do families. We are going to do families. How about that? We are going to definitely do families. So when it comes to families in general, um, we're looking under the systems umbrella, right? The family systems. That is, everything falls under the systems theory. Okay, so I start off with like my eco map, right? So eco map and genogram, I'm looking at my eco map. The eco map is my ecological system that belongs to who? Right. Go ahead. In the home stretch, working hard in the kitchen and master bathroom. That's Braun Fem Bremer. And appliances are delivered. Right? Yeah, him. Yeah. Him. Yeah, you knew that. <laughs> That's Braun Fem Bremer. And that you learned that way back in the day, right? That was some spell for me. Owen is, um, oh. Bowen is my, um, Eco map. Brian Fan member is my ecological system. Oh, great. Okay. So my ecological system is is Braun van Bremer. My macro, my exo, my meso, and my micro. Um, so sometimes those are confusing also. When it's a child and it talks about their family settings, that is always going to be micro. Okay? I'm sorry, it's going to be a meso. Because a child cannot have a micro system. Let me, write, let me rephrase that again. When it comes to home, children, neighborhood, that is a child's microsystem. Okay. For an adult, that might not be my microsystem. That might be my mesosystem. But for a child, that school neighborhood, that is their micro because they, they can't live without that. So your mesosystem, sometimes it's a Z. That is your bigger, your home, your school, your neighborhood. Your EXO, okay, that's your community service. And then macro, of course, those are um, the big customs, the communities, all of that good stuff. And yes, it's Braun Fem Bremer. 
his ecological model. Okay, so Braun van Bremer did the eco map. Okay, so Murray Bow and Bowen is genograms, right? He talked about things that we pass down through our families. Eco map is systems theory, all of the systems. Okay, so then when I look at my eco map, this is the systems theory. So the questions that you'll see sometimes it talks about um, um, the input, the output. So I'm looking at an eco map when it comes to that. So the the um, the same with the um, the genogram. The thicker the lines, the better the relationship, right? Remember back in the day, the red lines are um, bad relationships, the green lines are good, and the blue ones are abusive. And most often you're going to see an arrow because the arrow talks about whether it's input or output from the from the family. So that's where the the input and the outcome, the input and output comes from that ecosystem. So when you're looking at the whole family and it talks about as um, you'll see a question about how information transfers from system to system. Okay. That is input, right? If I am putting information into your system, that's your input. The output is what I'm, what the sensor is putting out. So if you look at kind of one of these, let's see here. This one. Okay, so if you see there, so that's input and output. Okay, so if mom is taking care of it, Michelle, that is system to system, right? So when uh, information, when energy is passed through another system, that is input. Output is what the system puts out. So you look at that big picture, Maury Bowen, Ecomap, and then that takes me down to my family systems theory, right? A family systems theory is, um, yes, your eco map would include your church, your work, your set. Exactly. All of the things that are, are you are giving in and putting out to your community. That are every, and every family would have a different one, right? So if, you, if church is not part of your system, then it would not be. Okay. So then with my eco map, what I'm looking at then is my family. So it talks about boundaries and subsystems, all of those things that are systems terms. Okay. So then see this lovely family. I use this image all the time. If you've ever seen my videos, you're probably thinking, why can't you pick another family? Because I like this picture. Okay. So mom and dad are this great, so they're a separate system and they are they're also a subsystem of their own, right? Okay, so mom and dad have good boundaries between them, they're not enmeshed. They're perfectly healthy, great family. So then father's his own system, mother's her system. The two of them are a subsystem. And the kids, their own system, um, the two of them are a subsystem. And see, those are perfect boundaries, right? They're not too rigid and they're not too enmeshed. So enmeshed is when they're like, eh, yucky, gross, ah, okay? And when they're disengaged, that happens with many of my families who either have money or many times um, my poor families who just are not involved in their kids' lives, right? I was used like the column by murders. Like, how did you know? How did you know that your kid? How did you not know that your kids were in, a, in the garage building a bomb? And I, you know, you might not have known exactly what they were doing, but in a healthy family, you should know what they're doing. Um, you know, I've read um, research that talks about when your kids are in elementary school, you should know all of their teachers. When they're in middle school, you should at least know two or three other teachers. In high school, at least one or two, right? Because as they get big and they get older, but in, by, in elementary school, you should know your teacher's name, your kid's teacher's name. You should be in touch with their friends. All of those things, that's part of a healthy environment. So then the input from the environment that takes the system, makes the system run, that is anything that the environment, that system doesn't produce by itself, right? So, you know, I'm pretty sure mom and dad have to go to work. So everything that is you're putting into the system is your input. So that's, and if you look back at the other eco map, okay? So that would be like your um, your neighbors, your your the parents, um, the church, the... Um, okay, so all of those things that you're putting into the system, that is your input. Okay, so in think about your family. What does it take to to for your family to live, right? 
So there has to be income coming in. You probably, well, pre-COVID, you had friends coming over. You went to church. You had school friends. When, when a crisis hit in your family, there was a lot of things coming in, right? That's, that's the input. The input is energy that comes in from the other systems. It comes in through the environment. Okay, when it comes in through the system, the input then is, is turned into thorough put. So that is the energy that happens inside the system. Mom and dad have a great life together, right? Brother and sister are good. You know, mom is preschooling, homeschooling the kids. Life is good, right? That is their, that's the thorough put that happens in the system. The output to the system is what happens when you um, put the, what, what, what this system produces, right? So dad can go to work and do his job because he comes from a healthy system. Um, you know, mom can do what she's supposed to do. The kids are going to be great taxpayers one day. Healthy, great system. The boundaries are good. Individual boundaries, perfect, right? So entropy, what happens with entropy? Anybody? It, it's dying. And what would happen? How would this family die? You're right. Come on. How I know I'm right. <laughs> I, I, like, um, <laughs> I always think of like eroding and entropy. Like it fades away. It gets it gets okay. worse. It gets, so it get better. Entropy happens when my input stops. Okay. So dad loses his job. Um, mom and dad um, stop parenting. Um, mom becomes you know a, 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 a prostitute and she's out selling her stuff all of those things, then all of a sudden the input dies, right? Dad becomes a drug user and he pimps mom out. Are they having friends over for dinner? No, right? <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> so what happens is the system will then close. We're not letting anybody over. No one's coming in this house. No one is sick and there's no input coming in. That system closes and eventually it, dis it becomes disorganized and it will die. Because what will happen at some point is defects will come knock on the door and take those kids, right? So eventually that family will die. There's nothing coming in. There's nothing going out. The system is closed. Okay? Not a good system. So then the an negative entropy, right? That's a good thing. Susie's social girl comes in and she's got a big N on her, her cat, her, her cape, right? Da -da -da, negative entropy. And she's coming in and she... Make sure that the entropy stops. She stops the dying process. So Susie, social worker, has a big O N on her shirt, okay, because it's negative. She's going to stop the dying process. She's going to put some services in the home. She's going to make sure the dad goes to rehab and the kids, you know, might go to foster care temporarily, but she's going to put in these things in the home so the family system continues to run, okay? Entropy, negative entropy, input, output, thoroughput are all of my systems terms. Okay? System. So, of course, we couldn't learn just that. So one of those lovely theorists came along and said, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we just make this more difficult? So, we have structural and strategical family systems now, right? So, again, they're still under the systems umbrella. So, there's, you'll see some, some very much of the same terminology. The structural approach suggests that there's something really wrong with this family. There's something wrong with the structure. So my structural approach is by, is it who, who did that? Mnuchin? <gasps> Yes, I get the yes. <laughs> <laughs> Salvador Mnuchin, yes. <laughs> so what he said was um, that we have, um, there's something wrong with the structure of the family. That is the foundation. That is the way the house is built. There is something wrong here. Okay. So the, you know, the, the foundation, I, I don't know um, if you've ever, I've never had the leaky I problem my foundation, but I've seen the commercials on TV and your house is sagging, right? Like, you know, it shows the commercials where like, you know, the house is sagging, it's falling in because there's something wrong with the foundation. It's falling apart. So we can't do that. We've got to make sure that in our, uh, our structure is we are going back and we are making sure that it has, has a firm foundation. 
So if you're using, if Johnny is having difficulty at school and he is using the structural approach, then what would happen is we would come in and we would look at the problem in the family. No, I still don't want that one. Sorry. Close some windows here. Close that one. There we go. Okay, so um, Johnny is having problems in school. Johnny can't hold life together. Um, the problem is, is that Johnny doesn't have any structure at home. So under the structural approach, my assumption is going to be that I need to go in the home and I really need to help the family set up some boundaries, set up some rules. Okay, that's just most often where you're going to see my enmeshed and my disengaged um, techniques. So this, the assumption with structural family theory is that the, the family is just broken. It's just, it's too rigid. It's too uh, enmeshed, too engage, disengaged, but it's the whole system. We're not sure who is in charge. We're not sure if it's the, the, the kids are in charge or the mom and dad in charge. Um, I do see, we do see um, incest more often in our um, enmeshed families. Okay. So in our meshed families, again, that's my household, right? So in my house, my front door has a solid lock on it. I decide who comes in and out of my house, right? In my bathroom, the doors are locked, right? We respect each other's privacy. We have very firm boundaries, not too rigid, right? Like if I need to come in the bathroom and one of my kids is, you know, on the toilet and I need to do something really quick, it'll be okay. Nothing awful will happen, right? So, but firm boundaries. So the problem is with the house, if you don't have firm boundaries, anybody can come in and out of my house, right? So if I have bedrooms that the doors aren't locked, or if I have um, the adults can go through the children's phone, the, the adults tell the children um, inappropriate information or things that they aren't ready to handle, that's enmeshed. That's yucky gross. Um, I probably told you the story before I had a, a client at one point who, um, she was 29 and she, her biggest complaint, she came in that her father watched porn. So, um, and her, they were married. The mother had no concerns. Mother didn't come in and say my husband's watching porn. The, the child was 20, she was, her sister was 28 and her sister was like 29. They didn't pay any bills. Dad had paid everything their entire lives and they were living at home. And you're upset because dad watches porn. <laughs> That's between mom and dad, right? Those those healthy boundaries between mom and dad. What mom and dad do in their bedroom should have no concern of a kid, whether she's 29 or not. Okay? So that's enmeshed. It's ugh, ugh. It just it feels gross. Okay. So then my um the other one is the rigid ones. And those are then those are just extremely disengaged. And I will see those with, again, both my poor and my rich families, uh, my, uh, especially like with COVID now. So we have the, the, a lot of disengagement between families and school. And I've got a couple of school social workers in here. And, and what happens is mom is trying to make the bill. She's trying to pay all the rent and she's, she's lost hours at work and Johnny's not doing what she's supposed to, he's supposed to do in school. Right. And she's like, I, I can't, I just can't. And it's not that she, she doesn't care. She just can't. So she's disengaged because before COVID happened, I sent my kid to school and that was your job to take care of him, right? For those eight hours. That was your job. I'll be giving him back to me. I can't do this. So, and then, so, so diffused or my mesh, the boundaries are too weak. They're not clear um, and rigid. They are just definitely um, disengaged. Um, so you think of like those authoritarian parents. That, those are my disengaged, right? Um, they, they, they tell the kid how to think, how to breathe, how to do whatever, um, not asking anything from the kid. So I'm the parent, you're the child, will tell you what to do, but I don't really know you. Those families, those are my very much disengaged families. Okay. My, my permissive families, the ones that have no boundaries at all, those are my mesh families sometimes. They're your friends. She's 12 and we're buddies, right? Not okay, not okay. So subsystems, disengage, all of those things belong to um, structural boundaries. Those are those what we just talked about, the importance of boundaries. Some examples, um, a wife who's enmeshed with her child and disengaged with from her husband. You will see that many times in families that are um, drug users, right? Dad's an alcoholic, 
So dad comes home from work and mom tells the kids, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, right? Wake up dad. You know, she, they're, they're together in this very unhealthy um, triad as opposed to a dyad with mom and dad. And it's very unhealthy. Okay. The father who's very close to his, is very close in a mess with his older son because he hunts and he's disengaged with his daughter. Okay. So those are my boundaries, the importance of what it looks like. Um, some of the terms that you'll see, um, and somebody said before, you'll see joining. So my structural family therapy will join one of the members of the family. Okay. So what they're trying to do is if they can get in with somebody, right, then they can change the things. So they're going to join the family. Um, you might see the terms homostatic, homostasis, that also belongs to my structural family therapist, right? What's homostasis? Like a, like a sense of balance. Okay. Is homostasis good? It can be. It should be. Is it what the families we see? No. Exactly not. <laughs> so homeostasis is, is our routine, our normal, right? So I'm sure all of you have a normal routine. You come well, it might have changed since COVID. You, you come home from work, which means walking out of your office to the bedroom, right? That's coming home from work now. So that's, but your routine, right? That's what you do. You have dinner at this time. We, that's who we are in this house. We put the Christmas tree up the day after Thanksgiving. That's our routine. So we, we like our homeostasis good or bad. So if my family has a, ha, it, their homostatic situation looks like, you know, dad's an alcoholic and he comes home and he beats the wife and kicks the kids and that's it, that's their routine. We come in, we try to change their balance, right? Because this is not healthy and families like homostasis. So you might see a question, dad gets better and then somebody else gets sick. Because they're used to having someone having that sick, that sick role, that sick identity. So that is why um, kids return home. Once uh, my foster care kids, the minute they're 18, or if they run away, they go back home. As crazy as it was, they, we, we like to return to our normal, right? In our real life, how, how difficult is it to start a routine? I'm going to get up an hour every day and start exercising. How long does that last? We returned to homostasis, right? <laughs> Shoot, that's too hard. I ain't doing that. <laughs> it was cold. It was this. It was that. We all like our routine. We like uh, people are used to their 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 balance, their their turmoil. They are used to it. You're absolutely right. So we tend to return. Okay. Um, I, my must tell me the home home is too quiet. They like noise. They're used to it. They're used to it. We all like routine, right? Unfortunately, it's the families that we work with, their routine is just not healthy. But we all like routine. Oh my goodness! Was there about the store this weekend buying toilet paper? Right? Because we, because we need toilet paper. This is our routine. Right? So things change, and we didn't like it. Part of the 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 issues with COVID, you know, and and as we're probably going to reshut down, is we which things changed. Things changed. I went to the grocery store and I couldn't get this anymore, or I couldn't go see my friend. I couldn't go. Oh my gosh! And all we want is to get back to normal, right? So that's, we're calling it COVID fatigue because all we want is to go back to the restaurant with our friends. We want to have grandmother over at Thanksgiving and it's creating so much stress, right? That's homostasis. That's what we're used to. So ours are good. Most of us are reasonably healthy. Okay. But our families we work with are not and their homostasis is still important to them. They still like to return to normal. Okay. So, so that's my question real quick. Mm -hmm. So is the goal of structural therapy, it, it, it isn't homostasis, homostasis the depending on families what family return to homostasis. Our goal is to make families healthy. So, sure. but knowing that homostatic, the homostatic situation is not necessarily healthy for all families. So the uh, question you'll see is, we'll see that in an answer exactly. and I go to it. Exactly. And so what you'll know is like, um, Bobby, the, the, the dad using the structural family, um, theory, Dad has been an alcoholic for six years and now he is clean. So what is most likely to happen? And what's going to happen is one of the kids will become an alcoholic. Mother will get sick. Something will, will change because they're used to living in the chaos. So if dad's not going to be the chaos anymore. Something else is going to happen in the family because they're, they're used to living that way. 
Okay, that makes sense. Okay. And I think that we see this every day, even if you're doing therapy or, um, you know, tangible services. How many families have you seen that you have supplied or you've hooked them up with enough resources to get through and mm -hmm. to, to take care of things? And they and you come back two months later in the same place that they were in. Well, they've done nothing. <laughs> because they're, because well, they're, but they like mm -hmm. homeostasis. Change mm -hmm. is hard. And again, mm -hmm. when you think about that, think about COVID and what it's done to us. Okay, because it has definitely changed our, our, our thing. Uh, we have perceived chaos. Yeah, it's normal to them. Exactly. Exactly. Of course, dad comes home and beats mom every day. <laughs> Hello. And, and what's really funny is if when you work with little kids, um, they don't know it's different until they go to somebody else's house or go to school. Right. Because this is what they've always seen. And I remember having a kid tell me and um, her mother used to do like Coke lines. Um, and she was at lunch one day, she was like bending up the straw and this is like years ago. She was, well, that's what my mom does. And she, I mean, she had no idea that normal people don't do that, right? It's like, <laughs> because all you've ever known is your homesteading. So restructuring is a term for the, my family, right? The boundary is unclear. I need to come in and restructure the home. So again, my structure therapy is based on like my house. So I need to come in if my foundation is falling. I don't care how homostatic it is. If my foundation is falling, we're going to fix it, right? <laughs> but it feels so good, you know? You, know, you ever roll the ball on the floor and you're seeing like your house, like the ball is going, oh, <laughs> there's a problem here. <laughs> so, okay. So restructuring again, that's a family term. Homework. Okay. So homework is, um, again, should be used to increase contact between the disengaged parties. So mom and dad, um, mom and dad could definitely, um, um, if, if the kids are disengaged, if the kids are not, so sometimes we'll do homework. That's the term you'll see. You'll see that in strategic also sometimes though. Um, some of the other terms that you see, you see that one. I guess now it would be like, uh, instead of blogging, they're probably doing like a Snapchat or an Instagram, a TikTok. That's what my daughter always tells me, a TikTok. Okay. So, um, some other terms that you should know when it comes to structural, um, that equal finality, what's that mean? Sometimes oh, I'll say, go ahead. Say again. When a family uh, arrives at the same time, they have same, different same place, right. different different times, right? Yeah. Equal finality. Okay. Everybody okay. in this room will be a a licensed social worker. Everybody in this room will be a licensed social worker. We'll all be at the same place. We'll just take it'll take a different route to get there. Okay, so that's equal finality. We'll all be there. Okay. I'll figure, I guess you could write that on your test too. Equal finality will all be there on the, your board. Okay, so then, so structural family therapy, again, the family is messed up, the foundation is messed up, the house is messed up. Um, restructuring, that's when I'm going to come in and I'm going to like to change the family, right? I'm going to do some things that think this is just not working. You might also see the term enactment. That sometimes belongs to both strategic and structural. Enactment means I, I want to know what happened. Like, where was dad when this happened? Right? So I'm going to put the, you know, do you remember those shows on TV, the commercials? This is just a reenactment. This is not real. So I'm going to have the family place the family where they were when the argument started. That's an actment. That was sometimes that one might belong to either one. You wouldn't see it. It's so both. So again, remember this is the same umbrella under systems. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, Ranisha, make sure you guys get that. She said it was on her test. Equal finality. I had a question for the enactment. Is mm -hmm. that like a role play? So, so many times it's a role play. Sometimes it is just a, a putting the, the family where they were when it happened. So in my strategic family term, they'll use an enactment. And what they'll do is they'll, because strategic family is looking at a particular incident. So mom and dad were fighting. Okay. And then what mom and dad, mom and dad are fighting are, um, no, mom and kid are fighting. 
and the, the, the social worker will say, um, line up the family where everybody goes. So where, where was everybody when this happened? Was dad, you know, and was dad watching TV, not paying attention? Was mom doing this? Like, where was the brother? So he's actually going to put them where they were as they were taking, as that happened. Okay. Now we do use role playing many times in strategic as well. And again, you're not, there's some of the terms you'll see in both places. Strategic is um, a strategy. Strategic is the whole family's not broken. It really isn't. It is just that something has happened and we need a new strategy. Okay. So strategic is, I always, it's like a chess game, right? Um, the family did this. The family did that. Um, and I'm trying to, to fix the, they made a move. And, and many times what I'm doing is I'm making a move, you know, to checkmate because there's something wrong with the strategies the families are using, but they're not as broken as structural family. Does that make sense? My structural family is the family's just, the house is cracking. So the structural family is, you know, entropy has taken over. Susie's social worker couldn't come in and put on her cape and save this one. But my strategic family, that is uh, Jay Haley. And you'll see sometimes Jackson. You'll see sometimes um, Don Jackson. You don't need to know their names. You really don't. Okay. Um, so what they talk about is just how the family relates. Okay, so how we talk to each other and the goals of strategic family therapy are to teach the family to deal with this particular situation at this particular time. Okay, so it's not about coming in, changing the structure. I'm teaching you new skills. So this is the circular patterns many families get into. So, right, so the IP, that's the identified patient. So he is acting out. He's acting out the symptoms that the whole family has, right? Mom and dad, they look great behind the screen. I can't I go this on this. Yeah. I didn't show the last one either, did I? Back. So um the the whole family looks great behind the scenes, right? Those are the families with a white picket fence and and they look so wonderful. However, we on the inside we know that dad's an alcoholic and he's beating mom, all those things. And that IP identified kid, identified patient, he is acting out at school. And mom and dad are like, I don't know what the problem is. Right? They're pretending like everything is fine. That is my strategic family approach. Okay. So the IP is acting out. He's And the family attempts to address his behavior problems, right? So mom and dad argue more because the IP is acting out. And then the actions become a pattern. And the pattern reinforces his behavior. So it's kind of the circular pattern that we we'll keep going around and around in. Um, and not be able to figure out like what the real problem is. So that's when we step in with to have some new strategies to change these patterns. Okay. Define the problem, identify attempted solutions, determine the position of the client, design an intervention, um, selling the client on the intervention, assigning homework, doing a homework follow-up and termination. That's it. Okay. So the goal really is then you'll see these terms. This is where you'll, the ones that you'll, you'll see when it comes to strategic. So most often you'll see paradoxical directives. So paradoxical directives are when I tell the family to do the opposite of what I want them to do. So paradoxical always means the opposite. So if you have a medication, the question about medication, which medication has a paradoxical effect, right? That is going to be my, um, what is it, guys? Which one is that one? It has a paradoxical effect. Ritalin. Yeah, yes. Okay. Because it is a stimulant and it should make people hyper. But it works the opposite with my kids who have ADHD, right? So paradoxical is always going to be the opposite. So a paradoxical directive. The family comes in and the family has been, um, you know, the mom and dad are fighting. They're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting. They come in and you, you've given them techniques, how to not fight, how to communicate better, and they, it's not getting any better. So you'll tell the mom and dad, fine, I need you to go home. I need you to fight for 30 minutes every day. You got to fight more. You got it. I'm doing a, a totally opposite and, and, and making it outrageous, right? If you ever got caught smoking a cigarette and your mother told you to, made you smoke a whole pack, 
I'm sure none of you innocent, perfectly great kids never did that. Um, but anyway, my brother and I almost set the woods on fire, but we didn't get caught. We didn't know what happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a paradoxical directive, the absolute opposite. Now, sometimes that's also called prescribing the symptom. So whatever the client comes in for, again, the fighting, and they haven't stopped. So I'll give them, I'll prescribe that symptom. Go home and fight as much as you want. Um, the a paradoxical um, directive would be um, you've got a family who comes in and their little Sally Jane won't stop smoking pot. And you've told them, i will lock the door, set a curfew, reinforce. You've given them all of these things to do. And little Sally Jane has not done it. Right. So what you're going to do is you're going to then tell them to find. And you know what? Why don't you just go ahead? I tell you what. Why don't you grow the pot for Sally Jane? Because that would be so much easier, right? And that way you don't have to worry about her going out and getting it. And you can just harvest it with her. And I mean, it's ridiculous. Okay. Double bind. You'll see that one also. <laughs> it's cheaper. <laughs> I don't know. But it's pretty legal, I think, in all states to grow it yourself. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Um, double bind. That is, uh, you, you can't win. So, um, that's so ladies, when you ask your uh, significant others, if you look fat in this dress, that's a double bind. Cause if he says no, or she says no, you're like, Oh, I don't believe you. And if she says yes, the person says yes, you're going to kill him. So it's like, there's not a win. So a double bind is when, you know, I've tell, I've told you to do something. And then later on, I tell you something totally opposite. And really the person doesn't, they can't, um, there's no winning answer. Relabeling, you'll see that one also. So relabeling is just to kind of look at the problem differently. We're going to give it a different title. Okay. You'll see these also first and second order changes. My first order changes are, are uh, fake superficial. So the therapist has said to the family, I need you to go home and I need you to um, um, be nice to each other at the dinner table. Okay, we're going to practice that. But the first order changes are the kids are going to say, oh, well, that dress is not too ugly. Or mom, this dinner's not too bad, right? So first order changes are superficial and not real. Second order changes are the real ones. Okay, that's where you see family homostasis also. Families tend to preserve the familiar organization and communication patterns that are resistance to change. We like our routine. Okay, faulty family solutions. If you ignore the problem to the actions needed, you take action that's unnecessary, um, action taken at the wrong level. So whether they're taking at the first or the second level change. Do you think we'll have a question around the homeostasis? Oh, gosh, would... yes. Yeah. Um, anybody who well, wants... but, but to be structural versus strategic? No, no, they're not okay. going to. No, no, not at all. And again, please, okay. please tell me if I'm wrong, if you've seen. So so what, they, what you might get is in a structural family therapy, uh, using structural family therapy, um, would you um, use a paradoxical intention? I would not. That's a strategic family approach. But like boundaries and things like that, they're all under systems umbrella. That wouldn't they they wouldn't be that that petty. I don't think. <laughs> all right. <thanks. laughs> Again, if anyone has a, a better answer, please tell me, tell me, tell me. The goal is do you know enough about structural to know like what this is? Do you know enough about strategic to know what this is? That's what they're looking for. I find a couple of questions there, guys. Boundaries are structure. Hierarchy, that's structure. In every, in every family, somebody has to be in charge, don't they? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oh, yes. Okay. So hierarchy is going to be structure, Renisha, because that is, um, you know, again, that, that's the problem in my, in my structural families is, is they're not really sure who's in charge because many times, you know, mom and dad aren't acting like mom and dad. We're all enmeshed. Trying to pull up some questions, guys. If you have any, um, the test was wordy, but not like the APGAR book. Um, APGAR is great for content, uh, excellent for content. She is not excellent for knowing um, how to answer the questions. So you do need to know, and I do, I, I think TDC is great, but when it comes to content, there are things that you will only see in APGAR, only, only. Um, parallel processing, you know, that's when you and your client are going through the same thing at the same time. It's not the same. Those are only things you'll find in APGAR. So I just think, and read her from the back to the front. So that, that chart from the back, um, when it talks of the code of ethics, um, she explains them. Um, again, I would read the code of ethics from the code of ethics. Um, but I, I just think in those the supervision questions of like what roles of the supervisor plays, all of those are really in there. Um, I talk about the crisis intervention model, um, the racial identity model, all of those things. Um, and, and fortunately, she doesn't highlight the important things. Um, but definitely when it comes to just content, wow, just that's why right. that's the go to. This is so true. Like they don't just ask them straight up. It's critical thinking skills. Absolutely right. It's not they don't just like say, uh, what is this? Wouldn't it be easier? Let me pull up this one. Some questions in general. So I was trying to see if I could find some family ones. Sorry, I feel like I keep asking questions. Um, mm -hmm. What about like Satir and is that transfer? So Virginia Satir, um, um, she has those, um, and those are most often in group strategies where you see like the scapegoat and mascot. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those are most often, and again, has anybody seen those in under the family therapy session? Most often you're, they're under the group roles because what she said was the group um, acts out what the, in the group therapy, you're acting out those family roles. So the blamer, the placator, the communicator, the distractor, most often she has that, the scapegoat, the mascot. Okay, that's fine. I thought she was family for some reason. So, she okay. is, she is. I just okay. haven't seen her on the test under, and again, please, somebody tell me. Okay. And I'll put this in. So these are her, the roles that she plays the, in the family. Um, the hero, that's usually my first one, right? The placator. The scapegoat, that's the one we're blaming everybody on. The lost child, um, and the, the again. So and I'll put this in there. Um, again, please, if someone has seen these on the test, let me know. Was that a no, I'm not telling you, Pam? Is that what it was? Download it, upload it. There they are. Um, and again, I, I just, um, I've seen them under the group section of the roles we play in group, but she is a family theorist. Other questions, guys? Go ahead. Dr. Pam. Mm hmm So, something just came to my mind about the histrionic and borderline. Mm -hmm. they, um, they asked me, so the question was something like, the claim came in flirty, we're kind of resistant, 
and something, and, and she almost found it borderline, but then when they said she was like flirtatious, I was like, oh no, she must be histrionic, and I'm like, I was so confused. So I when I'm I looking know. for borderline, I'm looking for okay. black and white. I'm looking for um, uh, love you, love you, love you, hate you, hate you, hate you. She's gone through 17 therapists. She has unstable relationships. That's most often what I'm looking for. But they're both flirty. Like when they use that word flirty, it threw me all the way off. Because I'm thinking both of them, it, that was like the first thing they said. She was being flirtatious with the um, with the is that all it said? And she was, pro well, okay. So I got to give me more because because the, the the difference is my histrionics like to be the center of the tension. She'll flirt with you, but she won't sleep with you. My borderline will sleep with you and swear she loves you. And then the next day she's going to kick you out and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, I can't remember verbatimly what it was, but I knew it was so confusing. I couldn't pick between the two, but I was able to eliminate the other two off the top. But those two, I was like, wow. So what I'm going to say is when you when you go, when you get those, go back to the question. You're missing something in the question. If you're having, it, it shouldn't be that difficult. You should get down to two, right? And then I'm going to either compare the two to each other or I'm going to... Um, I'm trying to meet people. There we go. I'm going to compare the two to each other, or I'm going to go back to the question and figure out how, how do I know? How do I know? It's not a, it's, they're not trying to trick you. They're trying to see, do you know? So my histrionics, they're the ones they are amazingly, you know, oh my gosh, look at me, look at me, look at me. Right. Um, but they're not going to sleep with you. My borderlines are going to have, they're of a period of unstable relationships. So what you might have seen in the first part of the question is, um, you know, she comes in and she says, you're the very, you're the best therapist ever. I've had 17 before you and you are the most amazing one that I've ever seen. That's my histrionic. Hey, and if you, I always say to my girls, if you, if you don't know the histrionic in your group, it's probably you. You see my screen? Number 81. Family centered social work practice is preferred over individual counseling when. So, in general, guys, remember when we're doing, when we're working with the family, we only work with the family, right? We, we're not going to work with the, if mom has an issue, dad has an issue, we send them out. Family issues are only done, done in the family. The family is seen as one unit. go back to the question okay so family-centered social work practice is preferred over individual counseling when okay I can't see the question mm, anybody else got that problem what number is um, it is number so the problem is it starts on the bottom of 81 at the bottom see Do you see that family centered? No, just say no if you don't. Yes. 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 Okay. So it's at the bottom, 81. So family centered social work practice is preferred over individual counseling when. I'm not able to see the choices. The choices on the next page. I'm sorry. They won't let me put them on the same page. So the question is family centered approaches, family-centered social work approaches are preferred over individual counseling when? So when are they preferred? Okay, the answer was A. Boundaries within the family structure are continually being violated. Okay. So I know with violence against the perpetrator, do I ever see the family together if there's a violence going on? Nope, I do not, right? 
Um, and if a client comes in and if if the wife is having, the, so working with a, a couple and the wife is having marital issues or some concerns maybe from childhood, I can't see her. So I'm going to send her out for individual therapy and then still see the family for, uh, or the couple for couples therapy. So it's okay to refer that other person out who's got different issues, but I can't see them. Even in a rural community, I can't see them. Okay. And let's go ahead and look at 82 while we're here. So a social worker receives a referral from a client who has been diagnosed with both obsessive compulsive disorder and tick disorder. The client reports regularly taking medication prescribed by his psychiatrist, but still cannot control his urges. He would like to reduce his obsession, obsessive thoughts and compulsions and that accompany them in order to best assist the client. The social worker should what? What's the best approach to, to treating my um, and this is an LCSW guys question. So my LMSWs um, don't freak out, but you should know it. My first thought is probably, okay, so OCD is what? OCD is an anxiety disorder, right? Now I'm thinking, what's the best way to treat anxiety disorders? See, behavioral. It is, it is behavioral. It is, it is, it is. You got it. You got it. Okay. Now, my first choice would have been CBT. Uh -uh, would it not have? My bell. Gotcha. My first choice would have been CBT. And what happens many times is I know that the best, exactly, I know the best way to treat uh, an anxiety, a mood disorder is with CBT and medication. I know that. That is what research tells me. I know that answer. But it wasn't one of my choices then. So what happens many times is we, we, well, oh my gosh, I know the answer and it's not there. And then I begin to freak out and then I'm going to question everything I've ever known. Right. So solution focused. Those are, those are that, that miracle question. You wake up tomorrow and the, the miracle happened. Existentialism. That is why do I exist? What is my purpose in life? That's Viktor Frankl. Um, psychoanalytic is Freud. Anything unconscious. And a behavioral approach is the closest thing to what I'm thinking, which is CBT. So remember, I'm looking for the best of the four answers based on the knowledge I have. So when the answer you see is not there, don't freak out. Don't freak out. Okay. Like logotherapy, that sure is. Um, so logotherapy and ex existentialism are the same. Why do I exist? What is my purpose in life? LMSWs don't freak out. Um, Renisha, did you see that on the LMSW test? Yeah, no, it's an APGAR. You are correct. Okay. So um, let's go back. Let's look at M84. A social worker is hired by an agency to produce a consultant to, pr to provide consultant aimed Consultant, consultant, consultation, let's try that again, aimed at reducing high client dropout rates. According to the funder, a greater proportion of this agency's clients leave services when compared with clients of similar providers. Excuse me. What is the source of the social work's authority when making recommendations? Like what? Right? God, it's one of those indirect questions and I don't know what to do. And oh my gosh. Okay. So oh, I'm going to go back and make sure I understand the question. That's the first thing I'm going to do. So a social worker um, is hired by an agency to provide consultation aimed at reducing the high client dropout rate. According to the funder, they're spending too much money on this, right? So what is the source of the social worker's authority when she's making recommendations? So remember, when the consultant comes in, um, you do not have to take their advice. OK, if you don't agree with them, especially if you are, if you're, um, you know, um, if they're saying something that's unethical, you do not have to take their advice ever, ever, ever. The consultant is com is paid to come in, offer their opinion on this particular situation and they leave. OK, 
And the answer is C, your professional expertise. Um, I serve as a consultant um, for our school system. Um, and, you know, they will call me to come in and look at a particular case. I charge them by the hour um, and then I leave. So it really is kind of looking at that, what's offered there and how I can um, offer my assistance, my suggestion, and whether they use it or not, it's up to them. Okay. Look at 88. Stephanie, you can't see the question? I can, let me stop sharing my screen and reshare, see if that'll bring it up. I'm looking at 88, it's about halfway through the page. Okay. The social worker is observing um, to determine if the frequency of high rate behavior has declined due to operant conditioning. What is the most significant concern when using this approach? Okay, so she's observing to determine if the frequency of high rate behavior has declined due to operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is what? That's Skinner, right? Rewards and consequences. Positive and negative consequences, positive and negative reinforcement, right? Those are the terms. So then knowing it's operant conditioning, what am I doing? Sorry, someone came to my house. <laughs> Hello? Okay, so the answer to this one is B. Yes, there you go. It is B. So the key to that one is, okay, the social worker is observing to determine if the frequency of high rate behavior has declined due to operant conditioning, which is the most significant concern about using this approach. The client is in the presence of the social worker. I am observing. That is also called what? Does anybody know what that's called? Hawthorne. Effect. Yes! Yes! Yeah, that's the Hawthorne. Who was that? Camilla P. Yeah, yes, girl. <laughs> High five me. <laughs> the Hawthorne <Yes>. theory. <laughs> So the Hawthorne um, theory says that I wa I behave differently when I am being watched. Okay. So this one was a tough one, right? Because I, I, I said operant conditioning, right? Because you're thinking, oh, I'm looking for rewards and consequences, right? However, what I need to know is the Hawthorne theory that says that if people are being watched, we behave differently. Okay, so that's what content will look like in a question, right? And those are that's tough. Okay, stop it. Look at look at eighty nine. This is I'm looking at the trust isolation guilt. I'm knowing that's one of my one of my theorists. Stop it. Okay, so then, 80, I'm doing 89. The last one is inferiority. I don't know if you could see that one or not, inferiority. Okay, so he's, he's a third grader. He's struggling with school. Despite his poor grades, his parents seem disinterested in assisting him. 
frustrated by his academic performance, but doesn't know how to do better. What psychosocial problem is this boy most likely to experience in this situation? Okay, so psychosocial. Psychosocial, who does that mean? Erickson. Yes! Okay, if it's Erickson, I'm looking for one of Erickson's stages. And he is in third grade. So third grade is what state? How old are they in third grade? Seven or eight. About eight, right? About eight or nine. That is when I'm doing industry versus inferiority. I'm trying to figure out what I'm good at. That's where competency develops. Right? Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I do apologize on the second page. But that's so in industry versus inferiority. That is when I'm starting elementary school. That is what I'm trying to figure out what I'm good at. That is when your kids were little, you put them in every single sport there was. Soccer and dance and karate and this and that because you're trying to figure out what you're good at. So those all build on each other. So once you know you're, what you're good at, you're, you're, you feel competent, then you go to the next stage, of course, which is then what? Middle school, starting at 13, what stage is that? Come Identity on. and role confusion. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay, exactly. So let's go back and look at the question. So psychosocial, I knew, I knew it had to be Erickson, right? So I'm looking for all those things. So let's figure out which one of these is the right one. So isolation, where does that go to? Which, what, what age is that? Either I'm in love or I'm isolated. Yeah, that's my, that's after role development, right? So that is like um, 21 oh, to like 40. 40, yeah. Okay. So if you haven't found love by 40, <laughs> give up according to, I'm just saying, that's what Erickson said. <laughs> so <laughs> just hang it up. <laughs> um, guilt, guilt goes to what? That's three to five. That's my initiative five. stage. Mm -hmm, three to five. I'm going to try new things, right? And then if it didn't work out, then I will feel really bad. So that's, that's a typical, well, it's probably easier than Erickson, but that's why you have to know what it looks like. That's why you have to know um, what's going to happen because it, it gave you his age. You got to figure out what happens in third grade. And I got to figure out what happens when. So that's why it's important to know those. Look at number, because um, I just said this isn't usually on the test. 92, that's that satire question. So this, um, so Satir's theories were based on um, most often dysfunctional families. Again, I haven't seen this on the test, but I will definitely go over 92. And I did put this in your chat box. That is my scapegoat. That's exactly it. My scapegoat is the one that gets blamed for everything. It's sometimes also known as the IP, the identified patient. They're the ones acting out what the whole family is doing. Okay, let's look at 91. I talked about it earlier today. That's Margaret Mailer in object relations theory. Yes, Natalie, that is C, that is splitting, yes. And we think of splitting, what personality order do we think of? Border, what am I? Yes, my border lines, you got it, you got it, you got it. Um, let's go ahead and do 90 since we're here. Check the room and see. Hmm. Getting started. I have a paper due tonight. 
90 is A. You got it. It is A. Okay. Which of the following consent procedures best informs clients of the nature and the expectation of the social work client relationship, including confidentiality? Best. Those best question means that there is more than one that's probably right. I'm looking for that best one. So I should have been struggling with between two of those, right? Okay, so let's go from the bottom up. Ensuring the written policies are updated regularly and signed by the clients. Um, you know what? That doesn't really make sure that my clients really know informed consent, right? Asking clients to sign written consent forms prior to initial meetings. I don't ever want to ask them um, to, I don't ever want to ask them to, um, I'm sorry, I lost that thought. Um, I don't ever want to ask them to sign anything they don't understand. That's where we've gotten in trouble, right, with the whole Tuskegee and the, um, the, um, the research in the past. We want to make sure clients understand, not just, not just hand them out, understand. Okay. Provide clients with copies of all signed consent and other forms. That's a great thing to do. However, does that make sure that I, my client understands it? Nope. Okay, so A is my answer. Okay. Okay, guys, I do have to wrap you up. Okie dokie. So um, this one is, again, let me stop recording.